folks. We are house corrections and institutions, and we've shifted gears now to discuss our secure residential uh, facility that is to be built in Essex is to replace the current Middlesex facility. Um, we do have money in the capital bill to proceed with a 16 bed uh, facility and our counterparts healthcare committee have been working on uh, some of the policy issues surrounding this. And I'm going to turn this over to Representative Donahue. She is speaking on behalf of the healthcare committee and their discussions and um, where they landed yesterday. So I'll turn it over to you, Representative Don Donahue, and then after that, we can go into the Vermont the Hospital Association after that. So welcome. Thank you, Thank you very much, Representative Ann Donahue, and I will really try to avoid getting into the weeds, but we did, <laughs> did, we did spend a lot of time, we took a lot of testimony. And you know, just as a as the quick background review, um, the Middlesex facility, the concept of the secure residence, was always a part of the one-to-one -one replacement of the Vermont State Hospital beds after Irene, because they're locked, court-ordered, step down. They're not, you know, community residences because of the that feature of them. So State Hospital had 54 beds. Post Irene, we replaced that with 52 beds. Since then, we've added 12 new ones which haven't opened yet, which would be 64. Um, and this is then proposing an additional nine, which would bring it to 73. That's 54 beds to 73 in a really short time period with a lot of added capital for um, institutional locked care. We as a policy committee um, did not ever hear from DMH the clinical reasons for that um, theoretical increase in clinical acuity or needs. Um, there was other information we asked for and, and uh, didn't get that would have maybe informed other aspects of this. But we do know it's really well established that community investments result in inpatient, reduced inpatient use, less capital construction needs. Um, Vermont used to be the best in the country in terms of that ratio. Um, and DMH presented us data showing that in the last 10 years, we have almost doubled our rate of inpatient use per population base. And the community investments have barely remained, are barely more than stagnant. It was from 0.46 to 0.81 in terms of inpatient use per population, the community uh, use of the, the community access from 0.34 to 0.37. Inpatient and secure locked care, a secure locked is slightly less expensive than inpatient, but not a lot. This is much more expensive care than uh, community residences and community um, care. So it's the long-term money issue. The operating dollars uh, are the biggest piece of the, of the cost. Um, and we know that the emergency department uh, backlogs are rebuilding, but it's important to know that right now there are 50 inpatient beds offline because of COVID. So obviously it's rebuilding now, plus those 12 new beds we just invested in have not opened yet. So we're looking at a series of current unknowns. First of all, uh, as DMH has just pointed out, there appears to be a significant amount of new federal money that may be available to develop other further community plans. We don't know what that is yet. We specifically don't know. We don't have any plans in place for, for how to uh, put that to use. We do not know at all what the impact of the huge investment in 12 new secure level beds are at the retreat because they're just beginning to, oh, they haven't opened yet, they're just beginning. And the investment in converting 10 beds at the Wyndham Center to be, have the capacity for high level security. Um, so we don't know how those are gonna play in yet. And we don't know what the community role could be if that opportunity arises. Uh, in terms of impact on the, um, the, the 
flow clog across inpatient care that results in emergency room backups because this group of folks for secure residents is not the only group that's not getting an appropriate level care. They are not the only group stuck in inpatient care. UVMMC did a big study a few years back, identified a series of levels, and we asked DMH for report, which they did across the residential care system, which indicated every level of care is inadequate and is resulting in inpatient people being stuck. So what has changed since 2015, when DMH was first saying and the legislature supported increasing the number of secure residential beds instead of just replacing them, the 12 beds that we invested in that haven't opened yet, and the new information on the rest of the residential system uh, and the tremendous needs across that system. So we do believe it's absolutely urgent to replace Middlesex, and we do believe that at least 16, uh, in other words, the nine additional transitional beds from inpatient care are needed. But what we think there's a need for more information to make the right decision is the fact that we can't do everything and what's the best use of any capital investment in terms of those additional nine beds. Um, we think it's premature to make a, to lock in a final decision that they ought to be that highest security level and the most expensive uh, operating cost level um, and make that wrong decision before we are able to assess these, these other much newer pieces. And that's the basis for our recommendation that the capital be appropriated in your two-year capital bid, uh, bill for 16 beds, but to do it in a two-year phase the first year proceeding with planning for the 16 bed infrastructure, moving for the construction of eight of them, uh, eight rather than seven, just to, to split it, you know, eight, eight and eight. Um, while we spend a year working through those questions, fully reopening the system, the other 50 beds, the 12 new beds, um, identifying whether there are federal options, uh, what we can do about that, the remaining, you know, stuck in inpatient care pieces, uh, what's going on coming out of the Senate with S3 on forensic needs and the potential to need to build that and new, new capital construction there um, be, before locking this in. In that second year of the capital bill, the remaining capital dollars uh, would then go either to proceed to complete uh, the second piece of, of the 16 bed, the eight pieces, or to then say it's a much more critical investment and a better investment uh, to develop um, alternative beds within the community system. Um, and we have the language prepared uh, to do that uh, proposal. Um, we had a, a minority view in our committee, uh, and most of that minority view said, we need to do both. We need all of it. So yes, do the 16 secure, as well as um, capital investment and expansion in the community. Um, and, you know, I think we can't do it all. So the question is, what's most important? And we think it's premature to lock in the most expensive level without um, a review of what happens when we open the 12 uh, new ones and uh, what's really out there in terms of, of better community options to address the backlog um, that's currently experiencing. So that's, that's the fundamental piece uh, welcome questions, and we did have complete consensus uh, on the language that well, that we also added about what we would be asking DMH to do in the interim. And either, in other words, even if uh, if your committee decides that uh, the capital money should be locked into this level of care, that we still would want to ask DMH to be fully 
digging into um, these other questions that our, our language outlined. So I just want to clarify a little bit. Um, so your committee, I heard there was a vote on whether or not to go forward with the full 16 beds or not in a secure residential. Um, yes. And I think it was a, what was the vote result of that? So there were um, five members who supported exactly the language that is our majority position. There were four people who said, do the 16. And out of those four, uh, two or three of them were saying, do the 16 plus recommend um, additional uh, residential capital. Uh, and there was one member who abstained because he wanted to go much further than the majority view and in fact, put much more into the community um, so, so what was the vote result again? Six, four, five, four. Well, technically five, four with this, uh, one missing member and one person who said, I don't want to vote as part of the five because I'm a, a sub minority who wants to go beyond that position. So really so, your, your committee is sort of split and trying to figure out what to do, how to go forward with the right thing. There's thoughts, a lot of thoughts, but it's, it's kind of, it hasn't really coalesced in one specific path, except to know there needs to be 16 beds. That's, that's right. Um, and some folks think it needs to be much more than 16, um, needs to be the 16 current proposal and more in the community. Others say we ought to at least hold off on the second eight uh, in the exit site until we resolve these questions. Okay, One so wants to go further, so it's split. There's, there's consensus around needing uh, much more investment in the community, um, but whether we do everything versus um, let's prioritize what, what's the best use for um, eight additional beds. Um, right. That's so, where the split was. So five four split. So just to give you a heads up, we've got BGS working and trying to figure out what the cost implications are if we phase it in. Um, the current plan, if we op if we did the full sixteen beds, the current plan there'd be a shovel in the ground in June or July of this summer, and it would be completed the construction would be completed by June of next year. There'd still be some fit up in construction a little bit for the next few months and then bring in staff online and training so that the goal would be that the construction plan and opening right now is it would be open. The 16 bed would be open at the end of December in 2022, or the very first part of January in 2023. And it would be for a cost of around 16 million. So we're having that analysis being done right now. They're gonna have, if what we heard yesterday is this by phasing it in, will delay the beginning of the construction will delay the opening up of the beds and will increase the cost to the project. So right now we've BGS is working with our contractor to uh, work out those numbers and they are coming back in this afternoon. We're going to work uh, while we're on the floor, we're going to be in committee and uh, we're going to be getting that testimony this afternoon. So it may, it's been very clear that it will increase the cost and it will delay the project. So we, we understood there, we, we don't know what cost increases there are and we know that's your decision. Mm -hmm. I would note if, if part of the delay is some redesign, we, we have a strong recommendation about the need for some degree of redesign regardless. Um, there needs to be a redesign to change and eliminate some of the space that's been identified because of removal of the um, options. We right. also think it's critically important that from a programming point of view, that it be an eight and eight program 
uh, because a 16 bed program is not a residence. There's one intensive residence that has 16 beds and has been a sort of a clinical fiasco in terms of best, you know, best model. So, and that, that's not a lot of redesign, but so if redesign is the, is the issue, I mean, they, they may say it's a big delay. I wouldn't think it would be a big delay to just say the second phase of construction, uh, you know, might be delayed, but the, at any rate, there, I'm not the one with expertise. We're waiting I, to get that yeah. back. Yeah. We have and, and I hope they're clear on what the proposal is, because it may not be as long as they may be assuming in terms of what we would be suggesting. Correct. So, so we've got I'd welcome being able to talk to somebody in BTS just to make sure they're clear on what the proposal is. Well, we're going to hear that this afternoon. So you're welcome to. Alice, I've got a question when it's appropriate. Yeah, I've got that. So we do have a list of questions. We have Kurt, Marsha, Michelle, and Mary. Ooh, Kurt. Uh, Representative Donahue, thank you. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about about the EI, the change in the EIP decision. We went through quite a lot of work trying to get that set up so that there would be EIPs available to these clients. Can you uh, elucidate on why that change and, um, and the, the nature of the facility that we're building and how that redesign works yeah and and i <laughs> uh some of it we may have to talk offline because there, there's a lot of there's a lot of history um uh i think we heard a huge amount of testimony about the negative impact in terms of recovery of even having it available in a facility of people knowing that those kinds of coercive uh responses plus whether it's even appropriate for people to um be outside of a hospital setting at all uh, if there's a need for that. There's some key hospital oversight it, that's involved in using those kind of procedures. So we heard a lot of testimony about that. It's not something we had taken a lot of testimony before. There was also a broad misconception, I know on my part uh, and in the broader community that when DMH was historically talking about EIPs, they were only talking about brief hands-on restraint and people were stunned last summer to discover that there was a seclusion room being designed and that mechanical restraints would be considered. Um, that, was, that was brand new information to most people. So there was a really significant uh, testimony at, to us and pushback and we, we strongly, I think, felt that that would not be appropriate and DMH, listened to the stakeholder feedback and came back and said, we think that we think it's not essential to the program um, and we, we will adapt to be able to, to do that. Okay, Marsha, Michelle, and Mary, you got all my M, anybody M, any other M, M's while we're at it. <laughs> Dan, I was just wondering how many patients are there at Middlesex right now? Seven. 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 So that if we only went with eight, that only leaves us one free bed. It doesn't add. Yeah, I mean, I consider it basically the same. It doesn't add. It adds theor theoretically one. That's right. And when uh, our chair was talking about building, yeah, it, the price goes up higher when you pour cement two different times or everything else. Considerably That's right. If the, de if the decision was that we did need those additional eight as the highest priority, uh, we recognize that would, that would increase the cost. We don't know yet by how much um, to, to delay by a year. Well, I think even a delay would be immense cost. And uh, I think if we've got it set, in, set to go into the ground in June, it'd be best for the state to hop on while they could instead of delaying it but that's just a personal opinion but thank you no i recognize that i think we i think we're looking at um yes the capital is important but the much bigger long-term cost is operating costs and if we're operating beds at a much higher cost level then that's going to be a lot of money in the long term so michelle mary and linda Choi. 
Yeah, thanks, Representative Donahue. So you mentioned when you were testifying initially that um, at every level of care, there's inadequate results, which uh, which results in, in uh, inappropriate placements and hospitalization. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about if we did the model, the two phase model with an eight bed initially in the more restrictive vision of the secure uh, facility, and then the other side was some other model what what kind of possibilities do you envision for that? Do you would it most likely be on that same property? Would it be in the community? Would it be a different level of care? What what would yes. we be looking at uh, as those options? So it, it would be in the community. Uh, we're proposing that uh, on a quick turnaround time, we ask the community uh, stakeholders and providers uh, to say what they could do, and what it would do. It would be addressing the needs of other people who are also stuck in hospitals. Um, that was part of the uh, DMH bed analysis and the U of the MMC, that there are other people who are also stuck who are also not getting appropriate step down out of the hospital. That includes people who uh, need to be in a nursing home and nursing homes won't admit them, people who need the intensive residential level. Intensive residentials are maxed out because there's no step down from that. Supported community housing can, reduce, can get more people out of intensives so that people can step down out of the hospital. All of those parts of the system are at capacity and DMH agrees that those all need. So it's what is the most important in terms of getting people to the right level of care, uh, which, which ought to be prioritized. That's, that's the real issue that we really feel to move into this prematurely uh, could really result in a lock, locking in the, the wrong solution. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Uh, Mary and then Linda Joy. So Representative Donahue, how much testimony has your committee taken on the community resources that you feel would be needed um, to help in this, I guess, grand picture of what we're doing. Um, and I'll make a comment before you answer that. It has been for years I have seen the legislature continue to hunt kick significant issues to the community. And yes, the community has to be a part of, of the plan. But the reason we're having the problems in our communities is the different partners in solving these issues don't have the resources, don't have, in many cases, the, um, the staff that has the level of the professional level of helping and treating within the, within the mental health community. So I see that a lot of our problems are as we keep looking to the community who does not have the pieces to do what we're wanting. And that's why we're having the different issues such as the backup in all the facilities. I mean, my folks down here are pleading for the help of having the appropriate number of beds to start the process, but if we're looking at if we're looking at just starting to have those discussions now of what the partners in the communities can do, and we don't have those beds to be able to have a safe place for folks that are in crisis, I don't see how we're going to look to start to resolve anything, especially when there needs to be a deeper dive on all of the what, with what we're discussing. So I guess please try to answer that. Um, yes, thank you. I, I do not think that it's about uh, community expertise. It's about the fact that they have significant staff vacancy because the legislature and the administration, but have have starved that system for so long. We're, we're we have not been putting the money into it. Um, they have been. Um, consistently um, losing, because if you're level funded, you're actually going backwards. Um, 
And that's that's demonstrated by DMH's um, own information on, you know, when I referenced the, the point, uh, the, the, you know, point, point 0.534 to 0.37 versus the huge increase that we put into inpatient care. Um, so that's the first part. I, I understand um, the urgency for that's being requested for uh, more high level secure care. We've just spent significant capital money at the retreat for 12 new beds to help address that. They haven't opened yet. So, you know, that's the huge risk about overbuilding is until we know what those 12 added beds are going to do. And I think there's the whole question that's also coming up about do we need a forensic facility that will be coming over to the House from the Senate imminently. Uh, it's on their calendar and they want to, they want that assessed. So that could be another whole um, capital uh, piece yet to come. And, and we don't know where that's going to go. So we've got all these unknowns and the risk of locking in one solution that might not be the right one. But how, how do we go from what is in many hospitals and, and communities that are having patients at a high cost staying in emergency rooms or rooms that have now been created by the hospital to secure folks and be as safe as they can. Um, that's a huge cost uh, at best. So Yes, I'm sorry. I'm I, I I didn't answer part of your question, I realize. I was trying to take a note because it was several parts. And and where does the money come from for those if we were going to do more community residential? Well, it, it comes from uh, the much higher amount of money that would need to be invested to open even more uh, secure, highest cost type beds on top of the 12 that haven't even opened yet. So you know, nine additional highest cost, um, th that operating money, if it was placed into community residentials for some of these other groups of people who are stuck in inpatient beds and using inpatient beds, um, would also actually give you much more bang for the buck in terms of the costs of operating them and increasing that capacity. So that's where the, well, that's where the money comes from. It comes from, um, not spending it on um, further levels of high cost care um, beyond the 12 new beds that are already planned for um, beginning with uh, beginning with the current year's operating budget to phase those in. So with all that you have put forth to us, I see some of these discussions and plans being put in place for this probably several years out. Uh, some of the communities dealing with the issues that we're dealing with cannot wait that long. And, you know, it's going to be a bigger cost if we keep kicking this can down the road. But I will respectfully listen and hope that I get something out of these next number of discussions on this, because I think the need is there. Yes, unfortunately, COVID um, has the 50 beds that aren't being used, and then the new 12 haven't come online, and I understand that. But I think the need, and especially with COVID, the cases are have even intensified, and the need is greater. But um, I will listen, and I respect you coming to speak with us today. Yeah, th thank you very much. I, I don't think we're kicking the can down the line when we've uh, put the capital into those uh, 12 uh, new beds coming online. Just we, we don't know yet um, whether we'll need more beyond that. So I'm going to interrupt a little bit because we're talking a lot about beds. And I know we got a couple questions with Linda and Karen, and we're going to, I think we need to get into this more with this afternoon's discussion, but the beds are not used for always the same 
level of care and acuity. I think we have to be very, very clear about that. We can talk that we've got 100 beds or 50 beds, but they're not going to house the same acuity of a person in a mental health crisis. Yes, thank you. So I mean, that's I the 12 new very, ones. Very clear yeah. about that in that the new beds that are coming online at the retreat are your highest acuity level one. So those are going to be just like your state hospital bed. The question then becomes when the person has been stabilized and does not need that high level of security and acuity, but still needs to be in a safe environment, in a secure environment, and with a high level of therapeutic care, where does that person go? So I, I just but to clarify, I, I'm just this, laying this out for the committee, Anne. In terms I understand, of the, but I, in terms of the flow, because what's happening, they could be taking up a bed right now with a high acuity purpose that they don't need that, but they still need something a little less. Where do they go? The question is, can they go back to the community? Would the community accept them? No, or, or not. But, but just to clarify, uh, Representative uh, Emmons, um, it's not a lower level of security they need. It is a lower clinical acuity. The whole point of the secure residential is there is that they're folks who can't go back to the community. So it's the sa same level of security. The retreat was designed from the start that it could be either a secure residential or an inpatient hospital. So if it turns out we need more on that end uh, because of the flow, that, that option is there. The Wyndham Center has just been enhanced in security. So there's a lot of moving parts that are not resolved. That's there's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of layers to this because those 12 beds at the retreat feed into our waiver for Medicaid funding. And that is looked at as our whole system in terms of our beds at the state hospital, our beds in Rutland, and our beds at the retreat in terms of length of stay. And in some of those facilities, the length of stay may be a little longer that would, that would lose our qualification for Medicaid funding. In some of those uh, other places, it may be a little bit lower. So when you average that out, that keeps us at the level that we can continue our waiver with Medicaid funding. So you can't just say you're gonna change the acuity of a level one bed at the retreat down to a, a little lower that would replace the secure residential because that may mess up your whole Medicaid waiver. So it's not as simple as that. And those are the questions that need to be asked and answered. For that. So I just want to lay that out to the committee. It's right. very, Understood. very complicated, very yeah. complicated. So yeah. when we talk about beds, there's different uses of those beds. And there's Medicaid funding that goes with those beds that we have to balance. Do we put that in jeopardy or not? So I just want to lay that out. We can get into that later on this afternoon when we have more testimony on this. So we have more questions here, Linda and then Karen. Um, thank you, Representative Don Donahue. Um, you're always a plethora of information in this area. Um, so my question is, was racial equity in the use of involuntary hospitalization evaluations and disproportionality of increased institutionalization in Vermont actually discussed in your committee? And was there testimony taken by DMH as to bed occupancy and the change in the population because of that? Um, we did get testimony on that. It was raised by several witnesses. Um, uh, DMH was not asked a response. And, and quite frankly, we, we did not discuss that at length in our committee um, because, you know, we, we felt there needed to be more step down for those folks who didn't need the secure care. Um, but there, we are aware, and the data is very clear that there's a racial equity, as with the, the correctional system, that people being kept in locked, secure environments have a much higher percentage of uh, people of color, and DMH has that data. I believe it's at the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, it's 15% people of color. They don't break it down beyond that versus... 
I think somewhere around the 5% uh, statewide population. Okay. Uh, Karen? Yes, thank you, Representative Donahue, for being here and sharing all of this. Um, it sounds like we'll, we're going to get more information this afternoon. Um, there's a lot of different factors coming into play with that. And two questions that um, come up for me is, you know, we have this kind of plan that's been percolating and moving along. And now we got this new information, new possibility to pause and do the eight and eight. Um, I think you know, one question is, you know, what is an acceptable cost increase? It sounds like that's, we're going to be discussing that this afternoon. Um, one that I feel like maybe is harder for our committee to determine, but what will be an acceptable delay? So say we find out it's going to be a three month delay, but maybe they say it's a nine month delay or long. I don't know. Like these are folks that our need to transition sounds like like five years ago. I don't know how long ago. So um, I feel like that would just help inform us as we're listening to uh, BGS come back, like what is an acceptable delay? And then I have one other question as well. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, I agree. And as I said, that th there are so many new pieces in part because of COVID, uh, one piece of testimony and uh, thing that was identified in our committee is this unexpected major investment at the Wyndham Center, which uh, raised the security level there so that it can be highest level security. Uh, and, and one idea was there is, a, there is a tomorrow need for that Middlesex facility, those patients. And even just with the current plan for that two years before it would open, uh, maybe that's a best use for that facility just as a, as a temporary transition. So um, I, I, I disagree. I think, we, I mean, I agree. I think we would, we, our committee agrees about the urgency of replacing the current middle sex capacity and care. Okay. I don't know if that helped me though to decide no. when we hear there's going to be a delay. I, and, so, and, right. So I just want to clarify about the Wyndham Center. Those are 10, 10 beds that are affiliated with the Springfield Hospital. So it would have to be the hospital that would then agree to change the use. And it's also connected with their critical access status as a hospital in terms of their reimbursement on Medicaid and Medicare. Right, they so, cannot increase beyond 10 yeah. beds because of that. So they have, so we have limitations there and it would be negotiations with with a hospital wanting to provide those services yep. for that. So those are layers that are on the surface, they're not, you're not aware of that, but as you start doing a deeper dive, things start coming up to the surface. Uh, Scott. Oh, can I, I sorry, I had oh, one so other sorry, question. Karen. Nope. The, um, Karen, then Scott. So my other question was tying this into uh, the testimony or the conversation we had this morning about the potential influx of new capital project money um, from the federal level. Um, and I don't know if this is for you, Madam Chair, like, is that, can that be part of the conversation? If we're getting this influx of federal dollars, can we look at something different or kind of shift things a little bit? Like, could we do this uh, residential thing and also consider how can we increase community? Like, can we consider the all, the all possibility? The federal dollars that you're talking about is for capital infrastructure. <clears throat> so it would have to be used to renovate a building, buy a building, or build a building. Not for contracting out with a community provider to provide services. That would be the difference because it's capital infrastructure, not operating for that. Just a thought. Uh, Scott? Um, I confess that this is all pretty confusing to somebody who's new to it. Um, I, I just wanted to ask about numbers. Um, Representative Donahue, thank you for being here. And you mentioned nine, a, a, a number of nine beds. Where was that? Is that is that the is that also the Wyndham Center, or is that something else? Uh, can I answer the that one, Pam? Can I? Just the, yeah, the, the the nine beds are what 
DMH is proposing to add in the secure residential because there are seven currently in Middlesex being replaced, which we support. Oh, I, I see. And they're okay. suggesting 16. Uh, we've been kind of talking about eight and eight just to balance them equally, but it, it's actually nine and seven is the okay, okay, okay. current split. Yeah. So we can spend time on, I'm looking at the time here, and we are scheduled at 11 to go over this hawk thing that, you know, we can be a little late for that, but we have a couple questions and we also have Devon Green, who's part with the hospital association that is scheduled to testify. Her schedule is pretty tight. So I really want to make sure um, we offer those folks time here. One more question, Michelle, and then we're going to go over to Devon and Lucy. Yeah, I actually wanted to just make a quick comment. I'm not sure. I mean, the Wyndham Center is about two miles from where I live. And I'm not sure if people know that it's set up as a 10 bed facility, but it's it was set aside as a COVID safe place for people having mental health issues. And there was an article, I believe it was in January, that only five people had been patients in that center since it was open. So it's being very minimally utilized. And as COVID is receding, it feels like in terms of looking for a safe place that we could move people as a transition, while we're getting this new vision of Middlesex ready, it feels to me like that could be a really effective use if we could get the permission granted through Springfield Hospital and all that. But it is a facility that has 10 beds, it's highly secure, and it's being very underutilized right now. It feels like the number of people that are using it, it might actually make sense to send them some, you know, anyway, I, I think that that's a, a viable option that really could help address part of the need here, at least in a short-term uh, basis. So that's a deeper question with the hospital association, Department of Mental Health and Springfield Hospital. So, so thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll, I'll sign off that. and, and, and listen. If you well, want I'll sign out. Yeah, I will. I will stay and listen. I just I hope that you'll hear from the community uh, Vermont care partners as well as, as the hospitals, um, since they have very different perspectives. Well, we have to get our bill out tomorrow. So we're not going to have time to do lots of testimony. I, I understand. But if you're taking the hospitals who, of course, want more hospital or hospital secure level beds, uh, it seems like there's there's a balance there. That's okay. all. Well, Thank you, that's madam. Why we looked out to yeah. your committee. Thank you. Okay, let's shift gears here. Devin Green from the Hospital Association and Lucy Garand. I don't know which one would be ready to go. Who wants to go? Devin. Hi, Devin Green from the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Thank you for having me in here today and. I'm here just to speak a little bit to how um, our hospitals usually end up being the canary in the coal mine when it comes to the mental health system, because we know that there is a problem with Vermont's mental health system when we see uh, backup in our emergency departments. Our emergency departments cannot turn people away. And so when we see people who are waiting days and weeks instead of just hours, which every other sort of condition is under, um, that's when we know that we have a real problem. Um, and I know there's a lot of swirl here now and there are beds offline because of COVID, but this has been an issue for a long time. Um, since, tw since 2010, um, or as of 2018, uh, our ED outpatient mental health uh, bed days, so days, again, not hours, have grown 348% uh, from, from 2010. So they have increased and they continue to increase, and I assume they will increase even more as the effects of COVID um, continue in our communities. So I don't see, this has been a long-term need. It has continually increased. This year, there were fewer uh, there are 1,500 fewer visits in the ED, but the, the wait time remained the same. So people were waiting longer despite there being fewer patients. So I am advocating for more resources put at every level of the mental health system. So we do have new uh, level one beds coming online in Brattleboro, which is hospital care. Um, and then I'm advocating for the 16 beds um, with the secure residential facility. 
Um, that provides a space for people that community providers don't accept. They feel like they don't have the resources to accept. That's a place that they can go when they don't need hospitalization. Um, hospital beds and secure residential beds are different things. The secure residential facility provides a transition. It you know helps people relearn how to cook, how they can, it helps them with housing. It gets them back into the community. Um, it's not, if, they, if, if patients don't have that, then they're stuck languishing in the hospitals. And we found that the residents who are currently in the Middlesex facility tended to stay uh, 300 days in the hospital, which is way longer and tells us that we need more capacity in the Middlesex facility. Um, the typical level one high acuity patient stays about 100 days. So the folks that are in the secure residential facility now stay much longer, we think that there's more capacity there to be needed. And indeed, Commissioner Squirrel testified yesterday that as of yesterday, she could probably fill most of uh, the beds in the secure residential with the patients that she sees now. Um, I think we have a real opportunity here. There's um, federal funding coming in. I know that you have your capital funding coming in, but there is actually federal funding that is earmarked for uh, community mental health services. So this is these are national numbers. We don't know what Vermont is getting yet, but there's 1.5 billion towards community health services, a community mental health services block grant which need to be expended by 2025, 50 million for funding community-based uh, behavioral health needs that are worsened by COVID-19, 420 million for certified community behavioral health clinics. So those are all earmarked specifically for community services. So I think we have a real opportunity here to bring our level one beds or hospital beds online. We've already invested in those. Invest now in the secure residential, the 16 bed secure residential facility, and then also use those federal dollars to, um, to invest in our community services because I would like to see our mental health system strengthened throughout the care continuum. So, Devin, I have a question on that particular piece. For those federal dollars that are coming through for the five years to beef up the community system, is that more for um, hiring and program needs, or can some of that be used to actually build um, or renovate? I mean, you're going to need beds. Yeah, uh, I don't. Is it to purchase beds as well? I don't have all the details on them. I think. Um, I'm not sure when we have, so I should be clear, it needs to be expended by 2025. So at the end of 2024, I don't wanna, mm -hmm. we don't have a full five years. Um, and I think it's worth looking into more. I know that there's funding for uh, health, community behavioral health clinics. I'm not sure what that entails, if that entails capital funding as well, but it's certainly um, something to think about. Mm -hmm. Questions? And I do just want to say one more thing on the Wyndham piece. That um, the Wyndham Center was open previously, you know, 2010. It was open and beds were available as the need was increasing throughout the system and the wait times were increasing throughout the system. So I, I, I know that the Wyndham Center has been underutilized this year, um, but prior to COVID, we were still seeing uh, a need there, despite the Wyndham Center being online. Okay. Uh, we have a question, and then we're going to have to wrap this up because we've got to shift gears to the correctional feasibility study. Uh, Scott. It sounds like there's a variety of levels of care in, in, in what we're calling community uh, settings. Are those facilities all contracted out, or, or are, there, are there facilities that are um, funded by, built by the state? There's no building in the community that's owned by the state. Okay, so that 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 is all a matter of of general. Well, I don't know about general funding. But whatever. It's not it's not capital funding. No, it's it's your contract. It's through the budget upstairs. They contract out sometimes with your local DAs, okay. designated agencies, or other agencies, other entities. But there's no physical building that we are responsible for, unless. 
anyone knows anything different, but I'm not aware of anything. Okay, thank you. Anything else? So we're going to be coming back to this issue this afternoon. Um, just be on guard from maybe one o'clock, one fifteen on. I'm not sure we're going to be working. We're not going to be on the floor, um, and um, we're going to have Commissioner Squirrel and Commissioner Fitch kind of go over the numbers. I think what might might be best is if you folks could just do the YouTube streaming. Um, and if you want to weigh in, you could send a quick email to Phil and say, you've got an answer to this. Maybe we could allow you to zoom in, give the answer. I mean, I just don't want to open up the zoom room to everybody because we don't have that bandwidth today or at the time we just need, we're taking under advisement, the healthcare committee, they're a policy committee, uh, what they recommend and their thinking is um, we'll be looking at language. Uh, they had language they're proposing um, and we'll be working with our drafts person, Becky Wasserman, uh, and figuring out the part with BGS about the cost and the length of delay, if there is one, if we phase it um, and make a decision. So I wanna thank all three of you for coming in. I know this is at the end, but we were letting our policy committee do their work before we got into any deep dives. And maybe we should have spent more time as the institutions committee doing a deeper dive. So, um, you know, we did the best we could. So thank you all for coming in. And then for the committee, let's just take a little stretch in your seat and Phil will let in, I'm assuming there's other folks in the waiting room that pertain to the Hawk report, correct? Thank you. There Matt. is a bunch of people. Okay, let's, these folks leave and then some folks will take their seats. And Phil sent to us uh, the report and I'm under the understanding that they may have a PowerPoint uh, I got a message from Eric that says that the Hawk individual, uh, Jeff Goodale, will be, I'll assign him as a co-host. And he has a presentation, I think. Okay. That's correct. And Judy is going to send the uh, a, a copy of it for posting. Oh, good. Judy, good. So that we can get that posted to our webpage. And then, because sometimes if we can just look at it, personally works a little better. Yeah, so we're, we're tap dancing and chewing gum at the same time today. <laughs> Join the rest of us. So <laughs> we're going to be uh, in committee this afternoon, Eric. I don't know if you heard that. I, I just figure I'm with you until the bill leaves the, the room. Right. Yep. Yeah. Well, Madam Chair. Yep. Matt, just a quick question. Is the expectation, are we going to be looking at this report through lunch or is there going to be a break or? I, well, I either way, just they, curious. I'm not sure yet because they said it's going to take two hours. I hope it doesn't take two hours. <laughs> it depends how many questions are asked. <laughs> Got some trail mix. Yeah. Yeah. They said it would be a two hour presentation, but I hope that that can be condensed because that's a pretty long time for us on Zoom. Okay, that's helpful to know. And I may pause and get a snack. Yeah, so that's why I'm just not sure when we're coming back, if it's like closer to one o'clock, closer to one thirty, depending when we finish with this. I, maybe what I can do is emphasize to folks is look at the very, very top layer of this to give us some information a little bit on how to move forward with the 1.5 for replacing the correctional facility and know that we're going to do a deeper dive of this once we get our bill out of the way and can really start focusing a little bit more because this is going to be a multi-time process. You're not going to grab everything on the first walkthrough. There's going to be deeper dives that will need to be taken. And we can do that after we get the capital bill out. We have time to focus. You can let folks in, Phil. Okay. So for Eric, who's going to lead this? Is it BGS? Is it 
DOC, who's going to be leading this for the introductory? Anybody, or do DOC we go direct the client? Go directly to Jeff. Okay, is the consultant. So, whomever is the ranking member of DOC should probably. I see, Madam Chair. I see that Commissioner Baker is in the room, and I agree with okay. Eric's recommendation that um, Commissioner Baker should lead us off. Okay. Okay. Oops, I see him. I don't see him. I see his name. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's going. I don't know what's going on with my camera. It shows I'm on, but. Is there a? Did you slide something over the camera on your computer or iPad? No, I don't think so. I did one day, and it was called hand cream. Because it looks <laughs> on this end, it really looks like you slid something over the camera. Really. Let me uh, let me sign off and sign back in just quickly. Okay. Don't we all love this technology? Oh my god. Commissioner Fitch, can I ask you a question? Sure. You never got back to me on the dairy. Uh oh. <laughs> on the dairy. Oh, on the wide. Oh, we have an answer for that, and I gave it. I believe to Representative Harrison. So let me. Um, I will go oh, take in my oh. emails, and I will send that to you as well. Okay. Thank you. You got it. Yeah, he's back, but not. Well, I don't, I don't know what's going on here, but we well, can hear you though. Well, and maybe, maybe you've been burning up the screen. You've been on too much. It could, could be, or um, <laughs> you know, there's a story that goes around. Since we're not recording yet, are we on recording? We're on. We're live. There's a story that goes around when my mother, when I was a baby, that she used to put me face down in the carriage because of my look. So maybe, oh, maybe that's. Maybe that's what it is, Madam Chair. I don't know. Oh my God! <laughs> Do a Johnny Cash voice. There, there you go. Yeah. Look, I, I, I don't. I, I can open up. I don't have a lot to say. I think it's important that we get. Um, I think it's important we get to the to consultants who uh, uh, have done a lot of work here. Um, okay. So, and if you're ready to go, Madam Chair, We're I'm ready. ready. We're ready. So, for the record, uh, my name is Jim Baker. I'm the interim commissioner of corrections. And uh, I know we have a large group here today. I want to start out by acknowledging uh, the level of cooperation and collaboration that went on between corrections and the BGS staff and uh, in the consultant uh, HOK. Um, they, they've been meeting nonstop for weeks every Monday. Um, the work has been incredible. Um, you're going to see part of the report out today, which is kind of a an overview of uh, more about the facilities and the delayed uh, uh, maintenance on the facilities. Uh, and there's more information to come yet that will be in a second presentation. So I, I think we should just get to the work. And then if there's anything at the end that folks have questions for myself or Commissioner Fitch, um, you know, we can get to it. But I, I want to reemphasize that the, uh, the work that's been done here is collaborative. And uh, it's taken a lot of effort to get to the point where we are. So I think we should just move on to the consultants and uh, get on with the presentation. Great. Thank you. So with that, we will. So we have Jeff Goodell here. Welcome. And I'm going to turn it over to you. And before you begin your presentation, if you could uh, just identify yourself for the record. And I do believe you're a co-host, so you can share the documents. Is that true? Okay. It, it appears so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, they have the capability. So, yeah, I'm, I'm Jeff Goodell with uh, I'm with HOK. Um, we're a, we're a global architecture planning firm. We have a specialization in the kind of uh, work that that you've hired us to do. And uh, before I get to the PowerPoint, I want to echo what the commissioner said that uh, we've been all working very closely together. I think it's been a tremendous collaboration with BGS with DOC. Um, we've had a very free flow of information, a lot of conversation, and, and I've got a great team that's been working with me and with, with them uh, to push this along. And it's actually been um, an exciting and a very interesting project for us to work on. So we, we really appreciate the opportunity we've been given, and we're, we're honored to uh, be working with you all. Thank you. Now I will... Go over that next line to make sure technology works here. It's working. Uh, working. All right. Very good. I'll go to the slideshow. 
And oh, let me get to the beginning of the slideshow, however. There we go. Okay, so as you're all aware, we are we are talking about the fa the, the first part of the correctional facility feasibility and conceptual design study, and um, and it is a two part structure. Uh, the first piece of it is the survey of the existing conditions, and, and the second part, which we'll be talking about in a subsequent meeting, conceptual plan for expansion and modernization of the facilities. Um, in the first part. Uh, review the documentation that's already been collected over the years with Vermont in particular, ma um, some master plan information from, from the early 2010s. Um, touring the facilities was on the list. And I must say we've been, we've had to do virtual tours <laughs> because, uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, but again, the DOC and the BGS has been fantastic in providing us pictures and data and, and, and we've done as well as we can without actually being able to step foot. We, we hope soon we can uh, step foot and, and verify some of the things we've seen. Um, the other parts of this phase review the population and, and provide projections um, of the population, uh, identify operational costs, and then make you know start with recommendations on the data. The recommendations really start to solidify into the, into the second phase. Just a little bit about our overall team. Um, as I said, I represent HOK. I'll tell you just a bit about myself. Um, I've been working in the corrections detention court justice field now for 35 years. Um, and uh, I've been um, in particular in the last 15 to 20, very focused with uh, departments of correction and, and other larger counties on mental health, on, on reform, on eliminating um, isolation uh, as a means of housing, and uh, and one of the one of the projects I worked on that that, that I'm proud of was working for the uh, receivership of the state of California for their Department of Corrections when the federal government actually took over their medical, mental health, uh, ADA, and dental, and we worked with that to get returned back to the CDCR, but they've been building in reforms in the state. Um, in, in, the, in their Department of Corrections and in county counties uh, based on that work. Um, and we've been working now with other states and others based on that, but also on our team, you know, McFarland Johnson for engineering, French Freeman French is our associate architect, and some other people that I've listed, Bill Garnos has been somebody that I've known for, and that, that he's been involved in beds projection, bed need projections for 40 years. He's as, as good as there is in the business in that. And Marcus Hardy is our operationals uh, analyst. Um, he has recently been with the Illinois Department of Corrections as the associate director of that department. Uh, worked closely with him on projects. And then White uh, for the cost estimating. And White is somebody that's done cost estimating for us on several projects very accurately um, and knows uh, detention and corrections work very well. Um, just you know, quickly again about HOK, you know, 15,000 beds designed and built in the last five years. So we are really at the forefront of what's happening in, in this business today, operationally based design that takes into account staffing, safety, work satisfaction, things like energy, reducing re recidivism and the economics of, uh, of what you have to do for a department of corrections. Um, and I've, I've been in this long enough to come full circle from when this was really about punishment very often uh, to now, I think really about looking for the best outcomes for people, you know, what will help people get back to society, be productive members of society. And that's changed the facilities and changed the way that we do things. Um, French Freeman, uh, Freeman, French Freeman has been a great partner for us. They certainly have great knowledge of your facilities They've worked on these facilities as well as, 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 you know, providing architectural services in the state for many, many years and McFarland Johnson, and they've been a really important member here too, because as part of the uh, evaluation of these facilities, it's not just enough to look at the space, but really look at the underpinnings of the engineering and other issues with infrastructure that could either help or limit expansions and those types of things. So they've been very, uh, a very important uh, part of, of the team as well. Um, just a couple of examples of recent work, and we won't spend a lot of time on this, but this is a new mental health facility we're doing for the Illinois Department of Corrections. 200 beds dedicated to mental health treatment um, that, uh, that the state has uh, started from a class action lawsuit of 11,000 uh, acute mental health uh, patients, people with needs. And this is the first tip of, the, tip of that iceberg in, in, 
in dealing with that issue, but uh, I'm very proud to say we were part of you know planning and designing this facility. You see an example of one of the day spaces where you've got you you have correctional staff, but you have clinicians with with patients, um, and in a in an area that's you know filled with light. Another one is a new mental health uh, that we're doing for the state of Ohio for the Women's Reformatory. Uh, that's the second consecutive women's facility now that we're doing for the state. And then um, you can see again that with the treatment, the ability to have a normalized facility where the outdoor space is really important, as well as, as certainly the, the custody space. And on a larger scale, this is the replacement prison we're doing, uh, penitentiary we're doing for the state of Utah, 3,600 beds. Um, in the far right is a new women's facility of 700 beds out of that 3,600 beds. So all of these are, are located right by the uh, Great Salt Lake, uh, moving out of a, uh, of a suburb of, uh, of Salt Lake City that has now been really taken over by science and technology development. One other just important thing, I think, you know, looking at, uh, looking at the vocational skill training, uh, that's been you know, a very important part of the projects we've done and have really great outcomes. This is in San Mateo, California, where one of the graduates um, uh, moved on to Panera as one of the executive chefs in, in their overall organization. And um, the ability to work with staff and to work in this kitchen and to be able to, you know, again, return back and turn things around is really something important, something that I think has been very satisfying for the people, you know, that, that run the facility. And another day space in a mental health facility. Um, so those are those are the examples. So in this first part, we looked at the at the six facilities you have at uh, at Northwest Northwest State, Chittenden, Marble Valley, Southern State, Northeast, and Northern State, and uh, did the evaluation and, and looked at several things, including number of beds. So we're just going to walk through those. It's in the written report, um, and we'll start with Chittenden which right now serves as your women's facility for the state in South Burlington. Uh, built in 1974, uh, takes up uh, about six acres, has a 177 bed capacity, and, uh, and has an affiliated hospital, but not robust on-site uh, medical facilities at, at, at that particular facility. At the existing conditions, you can see the site plan of how the facility looks, and it, and it essentially does take up its entire site. So it's really, it, it's, it's a difficult place to look at for expansion. And again, being built in 1974, that is, that is one of the older facilities. And that's, you know, at, at now well over 40 years in, um, in operation. Uh, that's when, you know, facilities are certainly in a position where they're, uh, you know, that's, it, they're difficult to, to just add to. These are some of the uh, photos of the exterior and some of the issues at the exterior. Um, you know, it's a, it's a masonry facility. So, I mean, it's been in good shape from that perspective, but there are areas that need, uh, you know, that need work. Um, and then this is an example of the interior shots of some of, some of that. One of the ones I'll point out too, and we see this a lot at kitchens, you know, they even, even newer ones, but with the tile and everything, they take a lot of use, a lot of abuse or there, there's a lot of maintenance that has to take place with those but you get an idea of, of what the interior of the facilities are. I know some of this on this committee are, are familiar with these facilities. Um, and then we have uh, the, uh, the cost uh, of deferred maintenance in the different areas. So we've talked about what the, what, what the identified cost is for the shell over 300,000, which is not for facility this size is actually not, not terrible for that, for that age of facility, interior renovations that need to happen, 2.7 million, uh, other services, 450,000 equipment and furnishings replacement, 144,000 and site work, which is often in these cases is parking and related uh, items. So we've, again, we've cataloged all of these, uh, deferred maintenance. And this comes from records from BGS and then surveys also with, with DOC. Um, other elements, as we talked about, uh, we, we went through a catalog of, of the issues that exist at the facilities. I'll just touch on a few on the site walk. As I mentioned, you know, uh, parking is, is one issue, but sidewalk uh, repair is, is something that needs to happen there. And then we have another list of, of items. Um, I think in particular on the interior systems where we talk about the majority of, issue, of, of interiors that are in poor condition, a lot of those have had a lot of wear and tear and have not had, um, not had replacement over time. 
on the service systems, you know, fire alarm has reached its end of life. Uh, the heating, ventilation, air conditioning has reached its end of life, and the plumbing systems are also in need of uh, need of repair or replacement. At Southern State, which is I, I believe is is your newest facility, um, at, in Springfield, that was built in two thousand four. It's an all male facility. It has a hospital affiliation with Springfield, and, it's, and it takes up twenty seven acres, or it has twenty seven acres assigned to it overall. The, and you can see the site plan here. So again, it's a, it's, a, it's a podular type of design with a campus style where the buildings are outside of the core facilities and inmates have rec space that they walk to um, or come back to, the, come back to the core facilities such as dining. And some, some views of this. Now this is a precast concrete or this is a concrete facility as compared to the masonry. And again, as I mentioned, it, it built in 2004. So exterior conditions on it are we're all in better shape. Um, on the interior, again, it's a newer facility. Um, and you can see that it is, you know, it was definitely planned and built for, uh, for a higher security level, uh, which is appropriate often for men, but that's the type of facility it was. In. And, I, and I think, again, I will note not a great deal of daylight in the facilities. Now, there are windows for the cells and so forth, but the day rooms and so forth um, don't have an abundance of that, which is something in a newer facility would certainly you know, look to improve upon. Um, some of the deferred maintenance issues are less there. There has been a lot of work done at, at Southern State. Uh, a lot of the piping and other elements of the, uh, uh, of the infrastructure have been replaced since it was built in 2004. So the current list of other deferred maintenance is, is now shorter on that facility as a lot of areas have been actually you know, brought back, you know, brought, up to, brought up to par. Um, some of the areas here, still some issues with sidewalk. Uh, uh, the, as we've noted, the, the majority of interiors are in, in fair condition, not as worn as they are at Chittenden. Um, there's some work, work order for some safe cells to be completed by 2022. Um, on the service system side, we still have some issues of fire alarm reaching end of life. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of the underground piping has already been replaced and the plumbing systems are in good condition. Um, the, uh, one other item on the exterior detention windows, uh, in fair condition, but the, but the, those windows don't have parts anymore that are produced. So there's going to be issues as far as, um, finding a replacement of parts for those windows as they've been discontinued. Marble Valley, um, in Rutland, the next one, uh, built in 1979, so it's of similar vintage to Chittenden on five acres. It's a small facility, all male again, 118 bed uh, capacity. Rutland is the regional hospital it's affiliated with. And you can see it's a much more compact uh, layout, uh, less parking, again, a, a smaller facility. And just some pictures of the uh, existing conditions there. Again, it's a masonry building, similar, you know, again, vintage to the Chittenden facility. And, uh, and then again, more interior shots. And again, with, with similar looks, I would say though, the overall look of, of Marble Valley is a little bit um, um, less wear and tear than I think that we saw at Chittenden. Um, more deferred maintenance issues there. On the shell, $300,000 worth. Um, on services, $184,000 worth. And site work, $512,000 worth of, of deferred maintenance is still in the, in the schedule to be executed. Um, the big one on that is improvements that need to be made to the perimeter fence. Um, the, uh, the brick and stone veneer in decent condition, the windows in decent condition. Um, the interior is in, is, is in better condition. Um, some of the detention doors and hardware though are scheduled for replacement. And, uh, we have, uh, fire alarm systems that have been retrofitted. So that one is not at end of life. So the overall building systems are actually in decent shape at, at Marble Valley. Northwest State in Swanton is the next one. Built in 69. So it's, it's certainly one of the older, if not the oldest, uh, eight, on 85 acres, 255 bed capacity in the hospital affiliation with Northwest Medical Center. You can see the layout there is, again, more similar to what we saw down at Southern. It's a, a podular on a, on a larger campus. Um, and these are the ex and this reflects the existing conditions, the exterior shots. 
I noticed a lot of these shots are on overcast days. <laughs> so they, so they all have a, have, a, have a similar look to them. And then you can see on the interior. Now some of the facility, some of the interior facilities are actually in pretty good, pretty decent shape. So, um, you know, they do, uh, we have window opportunities. So we do are, have the ability to get some daylight in. Um, but the overall shape of some of the interior facilities where it mates are, are probably better than, than some of the other ones. Um, and in terms of in, uh, deferred maintenance, you can see there's a couple of big line items with shell and interior. So there's some work that, that needs to be done here that's been scheduled. $1.8 million, or almost 1.9 for shell and almost $1.8 million for interior work. And so within that, um, on the outside, really the, the loading dock needs some work. That's probably the worst thing that's happening there. But on the shell systems, uh, roof replacement at the dining, uh, brick masonry uh, is needing to be replaced or tuck pointed certainly. And then uh, the, de you know, the detention windows have been recently replaced. So that's been, an, that's been a positive improvement there. On the interior systems, uh, some of the detention doors have been replaced, but some of the other detention doors are, are in need of replacement and other doors at the kitchen and so forth are as well. So that represents a lot of what that interior renovation number is as detention doors and locking systems and so forth are pretty expensive. Um, the fire alarm system was just retrofitted. Um, the boilers need some replacement, plumbing in decent condition, and uh, some transformers were recently replaced there as well. Um, at Northern State, uh, Newport, this will be the next one, uh, built originally in 92 with an addition to 97, takes up 47, 41 acres, one of the larger capacity facilities of 433 beds. And North Country Hospital is a medical uh, affiliate with that one. And you can see then this facility was built with split face block. Um, and it's kind of interesting when you see the ages of the facilities, it goes from brick, split face block, precast concrete, uh, the sort of sign of the times or sign of the, you know, of how things were typically kind of built uh, with a, with a metal roof here. And then some of the interior shots, again, some of the facility interiors, pretty good shape. You can see the day room sort of at the upper right, uh, pretty good shape. Again, lack of light, a lack of other, uh, sort of more typical newer amenities uh, or kind of requirements, I guess I'd say, in the facilities, but not overall in bad, in bad shape. Um, and now again, deferred maintenance uh, identified there in the shell 2.5 million and then other services 2.8 million. And even a significant number on the interior at, at, you know, coming close to half a million. Um, there are some concrete replacement that needs to happen. The loading dock needs to be fixed. Um, the tunnel has some groundwater and sewage leak issues and um, the kitchen has issues with the grease trips on this shell system. Uh, exterior steel windows do are not insulated and do not close properly. So that is an issue. And the CMU, CMU walls at stairs are cracked. And we see this often with uh, exterior split face CMU over time. It, it does have a tendency. It has had a tendency to deteriorate. And that's why it hasn't been in, in vogue now in a few years. Um, there are ongoing capital improvements to replace detention doors, again, detention frames and other hardware. Um, we have some issues with boilers and then, and then the plumbing system right now is a capacity. So if there is a look at doing an expansion at this facility, the plumbing system uh, would need to be addressed uh, to, in order to, to take care of that expansion. So I think we're, I think we're down to the last one here. Uh, Northeast regional in St. Johnsbury is, uh, is, is the next one we're looking at. Built in 1982, auxiliary building in 90. Uh, woodsheds were completed in 2000. It's on 47 acres, 219 bed capacity. And Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital is the medical affiliation. And you can see it's a little bit more spread out type of, ca uh, of campus uh, layout at this facility. And again, more exterior uh, photos. Uh, if taken on a sunnier day, um, again, though, with, uh, with brick primarily and, uh, overall the brick in, in pretty, you know, pretty decent shape. Uh, and then the, the more of the interior shots. Um, and again, you know, things have been kept up to a great degree on the inside, uh, you know, kept up as well as they can for a facility of this age. But again, this is starting to get in the, you know, in the older category of, uh, you know, where the where facilities start to, you know, face sort of life and end of useful life uh, issues, not meeting standards, so forth. Um, the deferred maintenance issue, and they're kind of across the board in the 
in the 200s and the and 300,000 for site work. Um, seasonal water ponding, some concrete replacement needs to happen on the shell systems, roof uh, system issues. Uh, the window system does need to be replaced at this facility. Um, the, the, the non-detention windows, the detention windows overall in decent shape. And a couple of the units have had some, some brick veneer issues. Um, on the interior, a uh, bigger issue is with, with, with showers. And that's certainly an area like kitchens that we see a lot of uh, wear and tear. Uh, they, they need life cycle replacement more often. And then other, other areas and on the service, um, it's sort of at its limits in terms of its capacity and some areas that need, uh, need work and replacement, including the generator fuel tanks. So there's some other areas that, that need, need some upgrade as far as uh, the, the uh, engineering systems. So now I need to move my window of view, folks, so I can see. All right. Um, that is that kind of wraps up our, our look at the existing facilities in terms of just their physical plant. Uh, now we're going to move into the part where we're going to talk about uh, the population at the facility and looking at where you're at in population. Um, I'll just preface this, you know, like every other system in the country, the pandemic has made this an interesting, uh, an interesting look because um, every system we know of uh, either released or reduced inmates um, to reduce capacity, but it's still unknown whether that capacity is going to come back up. So as we looked at things, you know, given that the, given that the pandemic uh, was a, was a was sort of a, a singular catastrophic, catastrophic event, um, you know, we're, you know, the projections still take into account what the, what the traditional history has been coming up to the pandemic. And I think, you know, in, in discussions with DOC, the feeling is that, you know, the, the idea that it can, you know, that it may come back up to capacity is, um, uh, if not likely, but very possible. And that, you know, the issues that caused, uh, reduction from the pandemic may not, may not be in, in, in effect anymore. So as we just looked at the, and we looked at these beds and Bill was, you know, Bill Garnus was the one that really spearheaded this look, um, over the last 10 months, there were a total of uh, 1,400 inmates in your in-state facilities, um, 90, 90 female, 1,300 male. And then um, you also had the, the other, you know, uh, out-of-state out of state that has been averaging, I, I believe, around uh, 200. Pre-pandemic, right prior to that, that number was 1,747. And again, with a, with a number of inmates that were, that were out-of-state as well. So... The current capacity in the state, including the out of state, is right now at 1,929 total beds. As uh, as Bill looked at that, and we'll get to we can get some more detail here. But what we looked at in the in, in his initial projection, in order to uh, have have facilities that that met capacity, bring the out of state inmates back to Vermont, but also have some um, additional beds. Uh, for, uh, you know, for the very necessary purpose of having some flexibility. Um, his projections were between 2,055 and, and 2,184 as a, as a really top limit on, on, a bed, on a bed projection that accounts for, you know, being 80 to 85% typically filled, but the ability to fill more if you need to. And what that also does is takes into account uh, the classifications that are necessary because we can't put everybody all in the same classification. So it takes into account a certain amount of maximum security beds, uh, medium security beds, minimum security, and then special needs beds uh, for both male and female looking forward for the state. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these charts, the, but these, this is the underpinning of how Bill did, did his projections. And these are from, um, you know, again, from actual data, that we received from the state. And again, you, you, you can see from 2016 to 2019, uh, you had a fairly steady uh, population overall of, of male from 1615 and down to 1595. But that's, I, I must tell you, that's, that's an extraordinarily uh, consistent number. And then of course we had a bit of the drop from the pandemic down to 1356. 
for the female inmates, um, again, sort of a similar story. In, in back in 2016, 143, 144 the next year, 150 the next year, and then 148. So again, extraordinarily consistent. And then the drop down to 97, or as I've shown before, 90, but the average being 97 for 2020. So again, that number has dropped a little bit. Um, but unlike the male, you can see it drop precipitously early in 2020, but then it's kind of come back up again. Um, for the in-state inmates, this is again, male and female together, 1,511 back in 2016, you know, stayed very close to that 1,500 number and dropped to 1,223 with the pandemic in 2020. The out-of-state inmates, um, now that number has stayed consistent uh, in Mississippi, 247 back in 2016, uh, up to 269, down to 226, 261, and now 230 in pandemic. So that number has not has not changed significantly from the uh, from the pandemic. It's been up and down a little bit more than your overall number, but it's still fairly consistent. And then uh, within all of that, because you have a because you actually have a a, a consolidated system of county jail plus uh, plus Department of Corrections, we looked at what the sentenced inmate numbers were. Uh, 1339 in 2016 through 1305, and then 1,088. And I guess I should say, when we looked at overall the data, we could go back further. In fact, we looked back further. However, 2016, in an, in an earlier, in an earlier uh, projection, many num number of years ago, it looked like there, there could be an increase up to 2,600 beds. That, that didn't happen. That, that didn't happen. So what we, what we looked at was more recent data so we can really gain some consistency and look where the real trend was. And consistent with other trends around the country, um, you haven't grown, as other states have not grown, the trend has been either to be more flat in numbers or actually to come down. And so we, we pegged 2016 as really that year that we saw that trend really start to become more consistent. And then again, 2017, 18, 19, and even 20 with the pandemic, uh, really kind of back that up. So that's really what we based the projections on, not older numbers that look like they might be growing because we're really trying to strive, obviously, for you to be as accurate as we can. Um, we we want to be a little bit conservative and not under-reporting, but we also don't want to over-report what, what, what we think your projection is because um, you know that could skew you to thinking you had to build more facilities and, and could lead to some unnecessary planning. So we're really you know, trying to use this history and this data to, uh, you know, to make this as accurate as, as we can looking into a crystal ball. The other part um, on the detainees, again, the number is very consistent, 419 back in 2016 through, you know, 2019, 438, 365 in 2020. So actually that number hasn't come down a tremendous amount. And you can see actually the number pop back up a little bit in 2020. So uh, the average of 365, um, is, is just a little bit below. So your, your, your sentence numbers come down more from the pandemic than the, than the arrestee number. And then uh, we looked at the federal inmates too, because we know that is part of your program. Uh, again, that number has been pretty consistent in the, in the fifties, but we know that you actually have more capacity and the, um, and, and our understanding is that the federal government would like to be able to have house more if they, if they possibly could. So, Looking at all inmates, out of state and fed and everybody that you have, that number was 1758 back in 2016. Again, tremendously consistent through 2019. has dropped to 1453 in 2020. Um, but again, as we look at the capacity, we're tending to look more at those 2016 through 2019 numbers because those have been your, you know, those have been your uh, your consistent numbers. The other thing I'd say is those have also been numbers that the other programs you have in the state to help reduce, uh, reduce custody, reduce having to have people in custody have already uh, provided some benefits for you. Um, and so I think that's another reason these numbers have been consistent. So we're taking that into account that you do have programs in place that, uh, you know, that have kept those numbers consistent, have kept those numbers uh, down from, uh, you know, from, you know, from being larger than what your, what your capacity is at the facilities. One more chart to look at. Again, the high-low range uh, back in 2016 got down to 1704, up to 1827. That was a high, that was sort of a higher. Uh, that in 17 were your higher marks. Those numbers have come down just a little bit in 18 and 19. 
And again, with the, with the pandemic down a little bit, although the high number in 2020 uh, was back as close as, you know, early was up to almost 1700. And then we just compared that a little bit, you know, with your state population, which is also, you know, pretty consistent. So the, the amount of people that you have uh, as, as wards of your state incarcerated has stayed consistent with your overall population in the state. Uh, and uh, that, that would be our expectation. Sometimes those numbers will skew based on uh, the profile of who is arrested. And that really does tend to be skewer for younger, uh, for younger males and younger females. Uh, but those numbers have stayed consistent along, again, with your overall state population projection and state population projections. Um, you know, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this, but th these are the different models that we looked at. So this wasn't just, you know, this wasn't just taking one approach, but we, we, we look at, at, at five different things, really. We, uh, we look at the average, the average projections, the average trend projections. So those are your average daily population. Um, and then we look at the, uh, and then we look at the overall projections, uh, you know, even going back to, back to 2013 and we've compared, you know, the earlier projections, we compared what the, what the current numbers look like. And that really gives us a baseline of current model projection of, of saying that your number is, is consistently looking at the low point from 1618 up to, up to 1747, or I'm sorry, up to 1814 is the high mark. So again, that's how Bill kind of landed in that, in that number at just a little over 2000 for all capacity, including the ability to have, you know, flexibility for classification and so forth. If we look at each of the particular facilities, um, those capacities, and I, I, I talked about them before, but here they are together. Um, you know, 177 at CRCF, 118 at Marble Valley. Northeast has 219. Uh, we have 433 at Northern State, 255 at Northwest, 377 at Southern. You know, again, with the, with the total capacity at 350 being out of state, we know that number is really closer in the 200s. So that total capacity, again, 1929 um, in comparison to what we saw in the projection in 1800. So, so you've been under capacity. However, it has been um, it has been close enough to capacity that we know the DOC has had to make some compromises in the way that they're able to classify and house people, just based on being so close to that. And clearly, I think we you know we've heard loud and clear that you know to have the inmates that are as far away as Mississippi has not been ideal, um, and that one of the goals is certainly to to look at bringing them you know back home to Vermont. And this is just one more chart to look at that. Uh, but this, again, this kind of sums it up again, everything else that we've just gone over looks at the total male population, female population uh, that has been in the last 10 months during the pandemic, the number that was before the pandemic against your total capacity. And then the, the chart to the far left or far right, I'm sorry, looks at what that capacity would be with everybody back in the state and I will tell you the working number we've really been looking at moving ahead is, is actually a slightly less than 2055 at 2050. Um, I think we've collectively, our, our view from the HOK side and then talking to the DOC is that 2050 um, takes into account a little bit of that, of that trend downward, um, but would, would again look at being able to have capacity with some flexibility uh, above and beyond what you've got right now for current capacity. The next thing was, was the operational assessment um, and looking at what the cost is and, uh, and, and, and how things are working at each of the facilities. And I just showed you, so again, the capacity, each one of the facilities, the one having the mission being the female, the rest are all male facilities. And then looking at the operating budgets for each of these. And so, you know, when you, uh, when you look at the per capita, that's the dollar amount per inmate per year uh, to operate. And, you know, at, um, at Chittenden and Marble Valley, I uh, will say th those, are, those are some of the higher numbers we've seen anywhere in the country. Over 62,000 at, at Chittenden, over 70,000 at Marble Valley. 
question, you know, one of the questions that comes up is, okay, why, you know, why are some facilities or why are some systems higher than others? One of the issues that we see with older facilities is that um, with, with older facilities, often it's fewer inmates for staff in terms of supervision. So your staff to inmate ratio, and you'll see that here in a minute, comes up. And then what, what happens is if, if the facilities are not expanded, the facility is not efficient, Departments of Correction, typically the only real resource they can do something about is adding more staff. So as they get more inmates, they add more staff, but that staff to inmate ratio gets fear, further out of skew. So you'll see the daily per diem at close to $200 at Marble Valley is a really high one. Normally we see those numbers probably more in the low you know, 120s like you see at Southern State. Um, you see that the Northern state is at 92. That's actually a fairly, you know, fairly low number. We see, you know, um, more metropolitan areas, New York, Boston, Chicago, other areas like that are probably on the per diem side, probably more than 120 to 150 range ones in other areas that are, uh, more in the South or more in the mid, you know, the mid South, those numbers might be in the eighties or so. So that by comparison, um, you know, the numbers, especially at Marble Valley and Chittenden are high numbers and they reflect what that, you know, what that high, uh, staff to inmate ratio is that again is to a great degree dictated by, you know, by the, uh, you know, by the facility and the ability to have X amount of inmates per, you know, per managing staff. This breaks it down in more detail. And again, that's in the report. Um, but this, this, this takes into account all of the elements that go into that operational cost. As you can see, when we look at the total, 82 million and, and 5.6 million is set aside for that contract with, uh, in, in Mississippi, 76 million then is your 76.5 is your in-state number out of that 76.5. It's staff staff is 64 million five out of that 76, five. So that's, you know, that's over 80%. Um, but that's probably high. Um, I would say that over, over a span of 30 years and in, in many systems, that number is probably closer to about 75%. So it's not terribly higher, but it is a higher number of your, of your staff. And again, that reflects again, the need to have staff, um, additional staff in facilities that are, that are less efficient, but you can see the other elements that went in and we really tried to take into account everything. Uh, that, that, that fit into your operational numbers. Again, we had a great deal of cooperation from the Department of Corrections opening their books and, and, and going over these things in detail. And we've had a number of conversations about whether these, you know, where, where we had gaps, we filled in the gaps. And so just make sure we really are capturing everything. So again, that um, I think we feel good about these numbers that they're accurate. And so your, your yearly uh, expenditure is, is over 82 million a year for your Department of Corrections uh, system. And this was just another way of, uh, of taking a look at these different facilities. Uh, as I mentioned before, Southern was the most efficient of those. Uh, Marble Valley, the least efficient, and Chittenden right, right there with, with them as well. So it's just another way of kind of parsing those same numbers. Um, we looked at the per diem again. Um, and again, these are all in the report, but I, I think what was important here is that we is, is that we really tried to take this data and look at it several different ways. And Marcus Hardy was really the, our lead on this, as he's been doing this almost identical job himself for now, you know, thirty years plus. Um, so he's got a, a great deal of experience understanding really what goes into operational costs and identifying these. Um, but again, it, it so it just ranks these different per diem costs uh, per facility. And as I mentioned before, the staff to offender ratio, um, and, and that really tells the story on the efficiency. Um, in um, over at, at Chittenden, it is one to one point five six. Uh, at Northwest, we're one to two point one five. Marble Valley is one point one to one point two three five. The most efficient one you have is Northern State at one to one uh, to one to three point eight six. We really uh, overall like to see that number probably more one to three, one to four. Some modern facilities are even one to six. One of the big, one of the big issues uh, that we see between a newer facility and, a, and a, an older one, is sometimes in a unit, you might have 16 inmates, you might have 32 inmates in, in medium security. 
in a modern facility, direct supervision where the, you know, the, the staff is with the inmate, that number is more like 48 beds in a unit, maybe up to 64. 64 is sort of the limit of good practice. Uh, but 48, you know, somewhere between 48 and 64 is the number. And a lot of these older facilities are more like 16, 32 and so forth. So again, it really dictates your, your staff to, uh, staff to inmate ratio. And so, uh, Northern state is, is, is closer to that. It's closer to that one to four. Uh, but when you go down to Chittenden at one to 1.56, that is a high staff to staff to offender ratio. And, um, we just kind of, again, we looked at the, at the different costs at each of the facilities on a per year basis. And, uh, and when we looked at the number of beds utilized, I mean, again, you could see again for 2020, the beds, the capacity is down practically everywhere except for Marble Valley uh, was not. The other ones though did come down uh, from the pandemic. And so we, again, we just looked at the ranking. So I know I'm showing you a lot of charts, got to show you a number of the same things, but again, we looked at these in a variety of ways before we you know, reached any conclusions as we sort of head into part two. So the last thing I'll talk about just is, is the program inventory. That was the other thing that was asked for. And to the right, you can see the breakdown of what that is, evidence-based practice, EBP, the mental health support, medical support, and substance abuse treatment or education. And looking at which of those things exist at which facility and um, I'm gonna have to, Move that around again. So these are these are uh, programs that you have at the state right now, um, and I don't actually know exactly what each one of them is. Um, the team the team though does overall, but you know, thinking for a change, motivational interviewing, uh, criminal conduct, substance abuse, uh, charting the new course, aggression interruption, cognitive behavioral intervention, uh, you know, uh, community high school of Vermont. Uh, prevent child abuse, kids apart, divas, uh, Vermont works for women, all these elements um, that are part of programs. And then uh, what do they, you know, what, what do they check? What box do they check in terms of that? And, you know, whether they're evidence-based practice, a number of them do um, gender-based uh, practically all of your programs do respond to gender, uh, you know, are, are gender responsive. Um, a number of them on, on the cognitive side, on, on, on working with uh, people in custody, on their cognitive ability and improving those things. There isn't a robust one on transitional housing currently. And I know that's one of the things we talked about. And I think as we look forward, transitional housing, reentry housing is something that'll be an important element. Uh, the Community High School of Vermont is certainly uh, a program that's very specifically on education. You have other programs that specifically address employment family, medical, mental health. Uh, so as, as we look, you know, as we look forward into phase two, you know, what are some of the things that really, you know, are we, are we, are we looking at? I'm, we'll talk about next steps here, but, you know, is certainly a, you know, facilities that are, you know, gender responsive that are very specifically for women, women's programs and for the reentry, also reentry for men, and also a more robust uh, view of treatment, mental health treatment, medical treatment uh, for all inmates, male and female, and being able to get, you know, get those services to them uh, really on a universal basis. So that, again, as I mentioned at the very beginning, outcomes are the important thing. Um, I've been in this business, like I said, 35 years. I'm very very sensitive to the, to uh, the issues with victims. I'm very, very sensitive to the issues people have with, should people be incarcerated? What, you know, what, why should they be incarcerated? When should they be? When should they not be? We also, also work on a variety of beds that are non-custody that are mental health treatment, substance abuse treatment. So, so we work across that entire spectrum. So as we look at, at the next step at, at the part two, we take all those things into account of what really would make your system really operate well, be the most beneficial for the state, be the most beneficial for the employees that you have at the Department of Corrections, and also for the employees of BGS, you know, they have to take care of these facilities and also for you and taxpayers. What, what are the, what's the system that's going to, you know, produce the best outcomes? And I think the most important thing is people that de need to be in the system or deem the need to be in the system, them being able to return 
to their families, to society and so forth. So just a couple of more images, just to, this is, this is one of the, uh, the new facility in Utah. And you can see the emphasis on more daylight, the emphasis on a more a robust day room, more area, more things happening in the day space. This facility right now is probably about 50% built uh, for the state. Uh, a lot of the pictures I showed you of your existing facilities, if I were to show you the ones from Utah, look very similar. So this is the new, you know, the new facilities they're doing, um, you, you know, move into this new, new approach. And then the other one is a view of a, of a reentry. This is the day space of a reentry in this particular case. Uh, there's uh, dog training for ado uh, adoptive dogs, rescue dogs, um, that happens actually in the space. And, and you can see there's just a more normalized environment for people that are in reentry as they are preparing to return and be done with their time uh, being incarcerated. So uh, with that, that concludes presentation. And would certain, so I would certainly be happy to answer questions and and, and, have, and, and discuss any of your comments. So thank you very much. This is terrific. You've given us a lot of background information and data, which I think is really good for the committee to digest over, over time. Um, some of the committee members are brand new to the world of corrections. So some of this data I think is very, very helpful uh, for members. I think it's also helpful to know what our bed capacity is in state. And I know we as a committee have done a little bit of that work. Um, and I'm glad that you also touched on, even though we may have um, certain beds, we may have, you know, 1500, uh, odd number, 1500 and plus beds in the in our system. They may not all be flexible enough to be used for everyone. And I think that's really important to keep in mind that um, some of our facilities, the way that they've been built and designed, can be limiting in terms of the use of those beds for particular inmates. And I'm glad that you highlighted that. Um, I think, too, the other thing that's really important, and we've heard this from BGS, whenever you're building a facility, a new facility, you always want to build in extra capacity. And we have heard around 10, maybe 15% uh, that you overbuild for the capacity. And politically, that gets into a quagmire because people are feeling you're overbuilding, you're putting in more beds than what you need. But in terms of a, a system, looking at a system, um, you need maybe more of that flexibility for that. Um, I'm looking forward to your next part of your uh, deep dive, and hopefully there'll be some recommendations on how we go forward with replacing our facilities. Um, do you have any thoughts on when that part two might be completed, just so I can figure out how this plays into our legislative session timeframe? Yeah, we're actually very close. We, we have, uh, in, in the report, we've, we've formulated a number of options um, that, and one of the things we were asked to do was to look at all, an all new approach, so we've done that. But, and also, on the other end of that spectrum, what if we were to just expand at all of the facilities? So we've looked at that as well. And then there are several scenarios in between. That, that, you, are you able to share any, uh, just a broad view of any of those options with us or not today? Um, I, I, I can talk through a couple of them. Um, I can talk, I can talk through a couple of them. I don't have them prepared to right now show right. And, and, and we're still, right. we are still crunching some numbers. So I, I, I don't want to. I understand that. I think it's just the scary. scope of what you're sure. looking at would be helpful. Yeah. So, in, in looking at one or one new facility, we really are looking at, I, I would say actually what that translated into is actually four new facilities because we understand the need to have a, a, a gender uh, specific facility really requires a women's facility and facility that is really focused on women's needs. In, in that, that also includes uh, a significant reentry element to it as well. So, so we're... I just want to interrupt to be clear. So yep. the women's facility would have like two separate entities to it. Correct. Well, an incarcerated entity, a separate building on the same property as reentry. 
Right. Or, or, or it might be a little bit, it could be a little se bit separated. One of the things with reentry yeah. is to consider what the job opportunities are for people in reentry. So, so that will, that would play into the location uh, of the reentry, but it could, it could be co-located, but it could, might be a little bit separated, but we would look at perhaps trying to share resources. Um, and, and, and similar thing for the men as well, uh, you know, an all in men's facility with again, reentry, uh, we're looking at a hundred bed reentry on that. 50 bed female reentry. One of the things when you mentioned the co co location though, that would be a benefit and, and, and even whether they were close or not, one of the things that we've seen that is a benefit that works is when the people that are incarcerated work with certain mental health professionals, counselors, uh, others that they can also work with in the reentry program as well. People that know them, That's people true. that have gotten to know them. And so that, that, that co-location or the, or the, or at least the close proximity does have a benefit in that your professionals really get to know the people in the system, get to know about their families and, and that ability to work longer with them and have more direct one-on-one -on -one relationship has benefits. Um, so then I'll go to the other end of the spectrum where we are looking at additions at, all six of the facilities and what the feasibility of that. And that, you know, that, that, you know, Chittenden is the one that's the women's. So we're considering that would still be the women's. However, looking at some of the limitations with Chittenden, we're still suggesting that a new women's facility would, would still be really beneficial. Even if you were looking for male facilities, they were expansions or additions. Uh, a new women's facility that was really more specifically for women's needs is something that that's still going to come in the, in the part two. And then in the scenarios that are in between, um, we look at what are the best facilities to, you know, to keep a hold of as your assets and Southern certainly I think fits into that category and the facilities in the North Northeast part of the state fit more into that category. The ones on the West Marble Valley, Chittenden, uh, Northwest, they, uh, for various reasons are more probably in the, um, in the category of, of replacement. So we have, we have a scenario that looks at replacing those, but expanding at the ones on the Eastern side of the state and down in the South and then in the Northeast. And then there's another scenario that looks at what if we just replace the one in the Northeast too, but we still maintain Southern. Um, so we, we, we have a total right now of five, different scenarios uh, that, that are those combinations of new and expansion. And we are also going to break out separately, um, you know, the ability, you could look at one at a time. So, you know, if you were going to look at what, if we did just build a women's, what would that look like in addition to then doing other expansions? So there's really five distinct uh, scenarios that are coming that we're looking at. And, um, and then, and then, you know, perhaps a sixth one, if we look at the women's, what we're now cr crunching numbers, we're looking at the operational models or the operational data that we already have on your existing. We're doing projections of future, these, these future expansions. Um, I will tell you, you know, the ones that are more consolidated facilities are going to be more efficient. The, 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 the yearly operational cost is going to come down on those. Um, but we're also then looking at the, at the combinations. And then we're also looking at the construction numbers on each. And I would you know, we're doing some analysis right now to make sure we feel those are realistic, uh, but we're going through that right now, but we're combining the new construction with what's been identified as, um, uh, as deferred maintenance issues that have to be fixed. Um, and, and in a couple of cases, I think some bigger engineering things that would need to be able to have to be addressed. And so by the time we're done, when what we'll present with the, with the part two of this is really sort of an all in number that takes into account with that operational cost and the construction cost and look at the overall construction cost, but importantly, it'll annualize it. So we'll be able to look at all of these different scenarios, not only with the overall construction, because everybody likes to look at that number, but the reality is you pay that on a, on a yearly basis, along with your operational cost. And what I will tell you is some of the models, the operational cost on existing is going to be higher where maybe the construction might be lower, but when you combine them, they, um, they have a bit of a parity with some of the newer scenarios, uh, you know, of, of, of doing that. And I think the, and I think the other important thing 
is that we'll have a lot of these scenarios. They don't all necessarily have to be enacted today. What we are hoping is that we're working with you on a roadmap for the future, that perhaps some of these things could be done soon, but other ones might be a little bit more in the, in the future. But they, they would give the DOC, BGS, and yourselves the opportunity to, uh, to look at a lot of these different scenarios and say, what works best for us, say, over the next 10 years? What could we plan for? What could we plan for money-wise? What we, could we plan for operationally? But I think more, maybe, maybe more importantly, is really what will we accomplish in these facilities? You know, will we now have new facilities that really address women's needs? Will we have new facilities that really address mental health needs? And, you know, how can we improve what we can deliver for the DOC? Um, and I think one more important thing about the DOC folks, the staff, you know, they, they have to work here every day. They come to work every day in a facility that, um, that in, you know, that embraces, you know, more, uh, you know, a better working environment. We know that reduces turnover, that reduces absenteeism, that, that improves morale, and improved morale for staff will improve outcomes for the other people in the system. Um, some studies recently of, of people we have associated with have shown interviews with some staff in correctional facilities have PTSD issues as acute as war veterans, um, that you know, they've been in these systems a long, long time. And, and, uh, and it's shown that some of the newer facilities are facilities that really, um, really address some of their needs, reduce these PTSD issues, and again, have a happier staff. The happier staff really then makes for the better outcome. So all the, those are all the things that we're looking at and we're going to talk about when we uh, present part two. That's terrific. Thank you. So I want to open it up to the committee for questions. I'm sure there's some questions. You're going to have to raise your <clears throat> real hand because I can't because it's still being shared. The screen. Can we still... take the presentation I, I, down? I'm going to take that down. You okay, bet. great. Thank you. So okay. then now people can use their blue hands. But Michelle? Yeah, I just have a quick question. I'm wondering, I was looking at the chart, one of the charts you had toward the end that had the predicted population numbers. And it looks like within a few years, uh, what what the projections are saying is that we probably would have over 2,000 people incarcerated. And I'm wondering, does that include, like your final slide there was some reentry model housing. Does that number of 2,000 include people in the transitional housing, or is that only people that are in the traditional prison model facilities that we already have? Yeah, that, that 2050 that we were looking at includes transitional. That's 150 overall transitional. So the so the in custody is 1,900 from our projection, and then the transitional is 150, 50 women, 100 men. So that gives us the 2055. I mean, those right. folks are currently incarcerated now. It's just they're in a harder bed. That's the only difference. Correct. Right. Because my understanding is that you don't have that option right now. So right. some of those, you know, some of the people that are in that in the system would then be transferred and be in that program as opposed to being in the um, regular custody. So the 2055 includes that 15 percent additional capacity. Right. To give you some buffer, or, you know, a release valve. Correct. Because you're building, you're building a facility for 50 to 70 years. You're not building it for 10 years. Right. Well, and in fact, to that point, um, often, often because of budget issues, and this happens with every client we work with, um, a lot of these facilities last longer than they ever thought they would. They're using them longer than they ever thought they would because it's, you know, it's unpredictable what will happen with your budgets over time. And you, and there's a lot of competing interests mm -hmm. as, as there should be. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have to look at these facilities being on a time frame, but probably longer. And so the flexibility part is especially important when you look at it that way. So going, some of us have been through construction projects and building facilities um, for and I may be putting you on the spot here for a facility that say is built a 400 bed facility and you have say 150 of the, 100 of those beds are transitional beds. Mm -hmm. What would be the construction cost for that? Do, can you just give us a broad, a, 
ballpark figure so people yeah. have a concept of what we're dealing with here so right now what we're what we're dealing with uh is a is a construction cost for the uh, for the custody beds of being somewhere in the 425 dollars square foot or, or you know between four you know f probably for your market somewhere in that range for the for the less uh, restrictive, uh, more the transition, that number is probably more like three hundred to three fifty. Um, and so, on a per bed basis, we're figuring off in custody beds around one hundred and fifty thousand a bed. Uh, it's just a you know again broad ballpark number, and then the less restrictive, more closer to the hundred thousand or so. Um, there's a lot of factors that can go into that of just you know of, of Certainly the more beds you build, you start to get some economies. So the smaller facilities tend to be a little bit more because you still have to have central, you know, central services, that kind of thing. Um, you know, a kitchen, uh, you, you know, uh, laundry, those types of things have to go. So when you build smaller, the, you know, the number tends to probably go up a little bit per bed, but those are, those are kind of the construction numbers we're looking at right now. Um, that we think would be appropriate probably for your market. So Did I answer your question enough? Or it, it do you... does. And I don't want to do math in public because they're always okay. get mixed up. But if you did a transitional unit of say 50 beds at a hundred thousand, well, that's just at a hundred thousand a bed. Does that also take in your, your community rooms, common rooms? Yes. It does. It does a hundred thousand a bed. Yes, that, so, that, that, that would contemplate all the different services, counseling space, everything else that would need to you know, be part of that program. And you'll see when we do turn in part two that we have done overall programs for all of these facilities that are more than just the beds. We, we've identified um, counseling space, kitchen space, administrative space, secure space, the amount of acres, acres any of these particular um, items would have, and then plus also infrastructure space with engineering systems, that type of thing. Um, even including, you know, taking into account maintenance shops, that type of thing. So when you see part two, it contemplates all of those things as part of any of these facilities. So it isn't just the beds. So when I do give you the bed number that does take into account, you know, additional pieces and parts of that that go along with it that are necessary. But it doesn't include purchasing land. We have not identified it purchasing land. So if we just did a hundred bed, um, a fifty bed reentry program in, on land that we currently own at about a hundred thousand per bed, you're talking at the minimum five million <clears throat> to build for a minimum security facility like that. Yeah, at a, at a very minimum. Yeah, I right. would say so. So I don't like doing math in public, but if you get into a three hundred bed facility of custody, that's mm -hmm. 150,000 per bed. Yes. Uh, I'm not doing the math in public on that. Maybe somebody can do that, but um, what did I say? 100, 150,000 times three, do 300, <clears throat> it's 45 million. Yeah, that's probably, I mean, yes, that's in the, you're in the ballpark. Yeah. And uh, I would, I, I should also say, you know, that is, that's raw construction costs. So it doesn't take into account other fees, other construction management that might be looked at. Certainly not the land, mm -hmm. um, furniture, fixture equipment, and then IT data. So, you know, those, those things would have to be added in, but, but if you're looking at the raw construction costs, uh, you're in the neighborhood. So I just wanted to put that out for the committee to know what we're dealing with. When we built the last facility, Southern State in Springfield, that was a 350 bed facility. It ran around 20 million for the facility and there were a few add-ons that they needed to do. So it came in at about 22, 23 million for the facility itself. And that was back in the late nineties and early 2000s. So just, and we had to purchase land too with that. Yep. So I just wanted that's, to get that's that. Con, yeah, that's mm -hmm. consistent with my knowledge from back then too. I mean, that's yeah. that, that you you paid a market price for yeah. for that facility. So I just wanted to put that out there for people to have that concept of what the cost is. Uh, so we have a couple more questions, Scott, and then Sarah. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Goodale. I'm I'm wondering about the elements 
of flexibility. We're talking about these facilities lasting, you know, as the chair said, 50 or 70 years, and which is probably not the design horizon, but probably the reality. Um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what uh, your firm thinks of as the elements of maximizing flexibility. Sure. Um, I think one of the things is to, is to, is to have housing units that, in, in the case, I think, especially of, of maximum security, medium security, to have those very consistent with each other. So you could use medium for max if you needed to. You could use max for medium if you needed to. The staff to inmate ratio would be very similar. Um, so, they, you know, and then if you go down from me, you know, medium down to minimum, um, I know the dormitories have been something that have not really worked well for the Department of Corrections, but you could be looking at some things like eight person cells or, or, you know, eight person bedrooms, that type of thing that, that, uh, that, that allows you to mimic more of the efficiency of minimum security without having maybe some of the issues that you've had with dormitory. The other things are to make sure that where, however you build it, there's additional horizontal expansion for a variety of reasons. Maybe your kitchen may need to expand over time. Maybe your warehouse should expand, be able to have enough space. I could add another housing unit in the future if I need to. And then if we look at the engineering systems, you know, if, if you don't overbuild them today, they have the ability to be built onto later. So a wastewater treatment as an example, either the city you're working with, or if you have to do your own wastewater treatment, you know, make sure it has additional capacity. So if you do add beds or you add capacity, you don't have to make major changes to a facility like that. The same thing with electric generators. Um, the same thing with underground piping. If you know your underground piping is being contemplated for 200 beds today, but maybe it needs 300 beds in the future, size it for 300. Um, and those are areas that aren't, uh, tremendous, aren't tremendously more expensive for you to spend on, but can make huge differences in doing additions down the road. If you don't have to, you know, tear up your your plumbing system or add an, or another plumbing system, and I would say one of the other things that is really more and more a factor today is IT and data. You know, more of these facilities now we are using, you know, there's there's Wi-Fi for people in custody, there's Wi-Fi for visitors, what for staff, that type of thing, um, and then the data that is being shared and the data being used to run these facilities. There's more and more of it. Um, not that many years ago, ten years ago. We didn't, you know, we might put the infrastructure in, but we didn't think a lot about what the IT data is. Now that number is equal to 3% of the construction and it goes up all the time. So being sure that your data system and your data infrastructure could support expansion, that's another important thing to take a look at. So I just think those, you know, being able to look at those kinds of systems and then being able to, you know, and, and build in some capacity either now or for the future for expansion and then have that flexibility of how you're going to operate your uh, your units are you know the areas that we really take a look at and try to try to maximize that you know for your future use. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Thank you, Mr. Goodell. Um, this is really terrific. I was. Um, really appreciative of all this data information and in particular kind of your analysis of some of our existing programs and where our strengths and where our deficits are um, in our system and with and 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 appreciate your comments like about spe specifically where our deficits are so <clears throat> without getting ahead of where we are right now i I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit about the pr your process for designing, because we know you're you're in the built business of architecture and design. We know that you know programs um, can influence how spaces are designed, and also spaces can uh, really impact our ability to develop to deliver those programs and for good outcomes. So, I'm curious, are in the in this phase or in the next phase, will you will you be engaging some? Um, Maybe, or maybe you can talk about how you engage um, uh, stakeholders or folks who um, do some of the programs and how you might access um, new ideas that might not currently be in our, um, in our program uh, or system. I'm, sure. I'm, that's what I'm really curious about how, how your experience nationally has, you know, what, you could, what you're bringing to this project in that way. 
Okay. No, absolutely. So you know, when, our, when, our, when we get to, when we get in the next phase of, of a more detailed program, and that's really where these facilities really become, start to really become, um, uh, I want to say, you know, you, you start to see what they're going to be in the programming area. Cause that is really, to me is the most important element. I mean, the master plans are important, but that programming phase, which is next. And what we, we, what we implement is a very robust and intensive workshop approach to these things. So whereas uh, uh, the BGS and, and, and you all are our bosses, so there's a core group we always report to, we really make the effort to have workshops with every group of stakeholders. And in some cases, that includes people in custody. We've, we've actually successfully done that. State of Ohio, we, we did that recently. Um, to really get some, some input all the way around 360 degrees of, of how things are at the facilities and what people want to see. Um, when we, you know, when we talk to people, for instance, on the medical mental health side, we have other partners that we work with that are, that are absolutely, you know, they, they, you know, they, they specialize in, in, in not only, you know, the medical part, understanding how, how healthcare works, but also understanding psychology and psychiatry at correctional facilities. And I would say, um, and HOK also does healthcare. Well, a lot of people do healthcare. A lot of people do corrections. The correctional healthcare, correctional mental health is a really narrow specialty that not a lot of people have a lot of experience in. I'm, I'm fortunate our group does. Um, but we would have those professionals come in and they would work with, with your custody staff, with your mental health staff, with policymakers, and really get that, again, 360 degree view on all those things early in the programming, then we start to identify what the capacities are and we start to identify those space needs. So as an example, if we settle on 48 persons in, an, in a unit and we'll say, you know, American Correctional Association standards would say, you know, every person that sleeps gets at least 25 square feet, they get X amount of daylight, they get all those things, we meet those standards those standards plus American with Disabilities Act standards. And we, in some of our mental health facilities, we have 100% universal access for ADA because that's just required in those. So, um, so we go through all of those steps and we also include our engineering partners to talk about, okay, so what are the engineering implications of all these things? So it's a pretty intensive group with, with a lot of team members and looking at a lot of different things. The trick is for us to get it organized to make sure we're sitting with stakeholders at the right time. As we go to that next phase then of taking that program and start to actually visualize how things work, we, we often do start with the housing because the housing often is 75% of any of these facilities. And it's extremely important because that is where the people in custody are. That's where your staff are. And we will start to actually use 3D visualization and other things to really say, can, is it safe? Can I see, you know, can I see everybody I need to see? Does it really promote interaction? Does it promote programming? Um, one of the key things we look at, you know, is will people in some cases, will we be bringing meds and, and, and dining to them or will they be going to a dining hall? What are the kind of programs do we expect them to take place? You know, you know, take part in, you know, all of those elements we'll look at early. Those start to do, then those start to define how the design works. And as we're doing the design, you know, again, we're working with our engineering partners. We really, I would say, you know, really take into account sustainability, making sure that we really are building the most efficient facilities. And some of our current, you know, corrections facilities are, are having a 68, 70% improvement in energy use over their predecessor. So, you know, these new facilities are far more, you know, um, efficient and, uh, and sustainable. So that's another element that we, that we build in. Um, and, and I'd say maybe the last element, you know, that's really important though. And as we've talked about these facilities need to leave, you know, last 50, 70 years, we really want to make sure that even if they don't look at, they're really secure, they're really built with really, you know, good security systems. We use some tricks like we use raised ceilings. So we might use a commercial ceiling that's less expensive, lets in more daylight, uh, but it's still safe for all occupants. And then the durability factor of, you know, the exterior systems, the roofing, your mechanical systems, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I pride myself in that we really put a lot of emphasis on that because I really don't want to hear from my clients who are my partners later 
wow, why did you spec that for here? Because five years later, we had to tear it up and do something different. Uh, I don't get those calls. <laughs> and uh, so though all those things have to be factored in as then we price what it will be to build it. We also look at the, at the staff to inmate ratio. So what's it going to take to operate it? And just as we're going to show you in the, in, in, in the part two, we'll have projections for operations, but those, those, those go in very much into the whole planning and design process as you really start to move towards existing buildings. Um, I'll add one more thing to your, your question. And, and as we look at spaces, we really implement a, a, a system that we referred to this referred to as trauma informed design that understands that a lot of the people that are in the system, um, you know, came to get in this situation for a variety of reasons. And we need to design a facility that responds to those things that makes those things work better rather than work in reverse. Um, so, you know, the ability to have a more normalized setting that any of us would be comfortable in has been shown to be very important for, you know, getting people off the treadmill of recidivism mm -hmm. and that type of thing. So while, uh, some people have looked at some of our facilities, wow, that's really nice. You know, what it's really about is having the right outcome because the important thing is that we have fewer people come into the system. And then when they leave the system, they don't come back and that you have staff that are happy and stay there. And those are all the, you know, those are all the outcomes and elements we really want to, we want to look for. So thanks for that question. You can tell I could talk about that a long time. I appreciate it. Thank you. We have another question, Kurt. Uh, yeah. Um, Mr. Goodell, this, um, it seems to me that part two is what, we're really looking for what I'm really looking forward to in that, in that point, we'll be able to make some sound decisions. I'm wondering if there's any decisions that we can make now that would help towards the development of that. that we as a committee could make that would uh, assist in that at all. Well, um, you, you could, but what I will tell you as a preview, uh, we, we're, we're going to present these different scenarios and I think we're going to make it fairly clear what the key benefits of those are in each of those. And I think you'll be able to choose from that and say, you know, this particular scenario does something very strong that we were definitely interested in, you know, and I, and I know from dis discussing some of these things with BGS and DOC, you know, some of the things that this group has talked about in the past. And so we, we take that into account, you know, as, and I would say part one, we really did our, our, our level best to stay as absolutely objective as possible to just look at data. Part two, very naturally <laughs> includes input, you know, that we've had, we, we, we don't want to come up with a scenario that the department of corrections would say, I can't make that work. I have no interest in making that work. So we've had some of those discussions. I, we know that, some kind of a transformation with a women's program is something that is absolutely key. You know, we know that. So I'll, I'll give you a preview there. That's, that, that's coming. I think the other part about, you know, dealing with more of the acute mental health and medical issues of, of all inmates, male or female, um, that's also an important element as well. Um, certainly representative, if you, if, if you have, uh, you know, opinions like share, we, we take those into account, but I will tell you, our report is getting, is very close to being published for part two um, within, you know, within days, not weeks, not months, but within days. So we're, we're getting there. Um, but certainly, you know, any input would be, would, we'll take into account. Good. Um, one other question. Uh, I know you looked at with, with each facility, you looked at the community around it and uh, medium income and things like that. Um, poverty rate and such. Did you look at, uh, have you looked at other sites throughout the state, um, especially if we're thinking of a new facility where those might be located or have you, or is that coming later? We've only looked generally. And I think that's been our, that, that's been what we've been charged with of not looking very specifically. The one thing, the one thing I would say is that, and this, this just comes from other departments that we worked with around the country um, and even one, I'll just give you one personally that we worked on many years ago for the state of California. We did a new state of the art medical facility in a, in a particular location that wasn't close to any urban center. There were no doctors or nurses or other people that lived anywhere around it. So it was a beautiful facility that never really got used. 
Mm-hmm. So the next time around, we built facilities much closer to some urban centers. So where we have, where we know we've got especially, you know, key medical, mental health, counseling needs, that type of thing, being close to where you have professionals that live, that's important. You know, that, that, that's an important thing. The other thing that I really haven't mentioned, but we also are taking into account is you have a partnership with your, with your counties in the state, with your sheriff's departments and so forth. So we know that they bring them to your facilities for intake. They stay at your facilities. So any scenario can't just ignore that element of things. It has to take that into account. And that's one of the difficulties if you were to look at just one all-in facility. Or where, where do you put it that works for everybody? That's tough. So, you know, that, there might, that, ex, that site might exist, but, but it might not. And so that's why it's important, I think, when we look at right now, like I said, we've got five different scenarios. It's important to look at all the elements of those five different scenarios, not only to think about the efficiency, not only to think about what the programs could be, but also what's the social impact and what's the other impact with your with your overall system? It's not just the DOC, but also involves your your counties and sheriffs. So, to, to, to answer your question, because that's not exactly what you asked. What you asked is, have we looked at some specific? We have not looked at specific sites yet, but we have some general ideas about where things might fit. Yeah, you know, there. You probably know that we're also trying to make a decision regarding the um, Windsor facility. And so it would be good if we had some input on that as, as whether that's a, how that would fit into any of these scenarios that you would propose in uh, of those five or six scenarios, if, if that would come into effect at all. We haven't touched on Windsor much yet. I don't know if that's, if that's something maybe BGS might, might comment on um, as well. Okay. Commissioner. Just identify yourself for the record and unmute. Um, my name, thank you. My name is Jennifer Fitch and I am the BGS commissioner. Um, so the scope of the project, right, is to look at the existing system and evaluate it and then to come up with some scenarios. This is called alternative scenario planning, right? So so we're looking kind of high level at some different opportunities and options. And so because Windsor was not in the current uh, system, if you will, that facility was not assessed and is outside the scope of this work. Now, certainly once we get past sort of the planning phase, if you will, right. And we have some recommendations and some ideas on how we may want to proceed. We're going to continue that planning effort, right? So we're not going to go straight into design. We're going to continue our planning efforts. We're going to learn a lot from the study as it wraps up. And then sort of the next phase and what we're asking for in the capital bill, right. Is to continue with, um, conceptual planning. So no, we haven't specifically looked at it and it wasn't part of the scope, but there's still opportunities to do so in the future potentially. Anything else? I think we're starting to close up here. Um, Mr. Goodell, I wanna thank you for this. I think this has been very informative. As I said before, I think it gives a lot of background information that will be very helpful to the committee, particularly because we have so many new members to the committee and, and Department of Corrections life is very complicated. And this gives a good base for people to start understanding the moving pieces of our population that's incarcerated, the needs of those folks who are incarcerated and our bed capacity. And also the condition of our current, current uh, buildings at our current facilities as well. I think it's been very helpful. And we do look forward to the part two um, of this. I, and that's where we will really be doing a deep dive. And I'm really glad that you're putting out options, different options, options one, two, three, four, five, six, how many. Um, we went through this process once before when we had to replace a uh, large facility that housed state government workers. Um, and we went through a similar process where we couldn't decide if we should rebuild or, or tear it down um, and move someplace else. And we went through this similar process with Freeman, French and Freeman, in fact, and came, they came in with five or six options. And it was amazing how that process worked and how all the parties really did coalesce around one of those options. And hopefully that will happen here. For that. That's my goal. That's my hope <laughs> for that. So I look forward to having you back um, and having part two. So any final 
questions before we take a quick lunch break and then come back to work on this? Madam, Madam Chair, I can't raise, I can't raise yep. my hand. You can't see me. No, uh, I can't. If, Sorry. If I can just uh, just a, a couple of closing comments that I don't want to sure. hold folks up and lunch. So no, again, this is, uh, Jim Baker, the interim commissioner of corrections. Uh, Jeff, thank you for that presentation. Um, Commissioner Fitch and I have talked about this a couple of times. Clearly picked the right folks to work on this project. Very impressive. Uh, very well done. I, I just want to remind the committee, right? This whole conversation got started because of the women's facility. And I, I think if you listen close to what Jeff was talking about, it hit a lot of key points that we've been working on, right? Mm -hmm. Behavior became behavior of the incarcerated, incarcerated population and staff, the impact on staff. Thank you, Jeff, for bringing up this point about post-traumatic stress syndrome of correctional staff that works in facilities. We're living that right now because of the pandemic and um, the staff is under enormous stress. Talking about operating costs, right? We have one of the highest staff to ratio, staff to incarcerated individuals in the country because of the way our facilities are designed. Um, you know, uh, operating costs in general. I mean, Jeff hit on all of this. The fact that we have gender trauma sensitivity built into all our programming, but our facilities don't support it. It doesn't support that concept. And, um, you know, the discussion now is moving forward about, you know, the money that's in the capital budget now. You know, you all know where I stand on it, and I know you know where Commissioner Fitch stand, stands on it. That's the next big piece for us to move forward. We're talking about things such as, is the Windsor facility a site to build on, right? Or whatever the committee goes to. But we're going to need that next step to be able to get to that next level of conversation. So I didn't want to cut into lunch hour, but uh, I just wanted to wrap this conversation up. And uh, again, thanks to, to Jeff and the team. Um, this is impressive work, and uh, we look forward to phase two. Thank you, Commissioner. And I think our committee feels exactly the same as what you just expressed, and really appreciate it. Um, anything else before we finish up? Okay, thank you. Thank you, folks. Um, we're going to take a quick break now. And Jeff, you can zoom out if you want. And Commissioner Baker, you can zoom out. But I want to hang on to Commissioner Fitch for one second okay. um, to talk about our secure residential. We're going to take um, a half hour break. <clears throat> we'll be back, I would say. Oh, let's try 10 minutes after 1. We've gotten the authority not to be on the floor this afternoon. Um, and I've encouraged the members to set themselves up for uh, being Thank notified you. by either their leadership or some of their colleagues if there's something that comes up on the floor, if there's a roll call vote uh, or if there's a close vote. And um, I am hoping to, uh, are you available, Commissioner Fitch? Around 10 after 1, one fifteen, that time frame, as well as Commissioner Squirrel? Madam Chair, I set that up for 2 p.m. I know. I Yeah, I know you did, Phil. I had a conversation with a Commissioner Squirrel this morning, and, and I haven't didn't bring you up to speak because I had such a hard time getting in. For the flexibility, not sure if we could get off the floor or what was going to happen on that. And I said, just be prepared for between 1 and 2, because mm. I knew we had scheduled at 2. Speak for BGS and say that we are ready to go, but I don't want to speak on behalf of, of DMH. And I do think that both DMH and BGS should be in the room at the same time. So, Phil, can you check with, with Commissioner Squirrel? She seemed to indicate to me this morning that she would be available, you know, that there's flexibility there. Uh, I, know I, will, I will check. That explains why um, her assistant was inquiring to me as to exactly what time we were going to meet. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be your desire, Madam Chair, about 110, 115? Is that what you're looking for? Right. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. I will see if we can do that. Um, I'm sorry I didn't let you know, Phil. This morning was a little crazy. With yeah, my I understand. With my electrical problem, and I had just gotten off phone calls and trying to 
juggle this afternoon. I wasn't sure if we even had the okay to get off the floor until we got involved in testimony. So for the committee, let's come back like 10 after one, 115 at the rate we're going, let's say 115 because it's quarter of one now. Um, and then even if uh, Commissioner Squirrel and Commissioner Fitch can't come in until like 1.30, we can spend some time as a committee kind of talking a few things through. We got- Alice, I'll, Alice, I'll hurry up my, I have a discussion with Commissioner Squirrel at one o'clock. So we'll hurry through that to get oh, her okay. into the committee. Okay, so hope, that'd be great. Hopefully Thank we'll- Hopefully we'll be on um, right at quarter after one. And Phil, if you could also let Becky and Catherine know that we'll be, because they've reached out to me as well. And I gave them kind of like, you know, I'm hoping for around one, one thirty. not sure yet. If you can kind of let them know that we'll be back at one fifteen, and hope to and plan on picking up with a secure residential. Okay.